there is a, a shooting of a man named Michael Wilson in April of 1990. Um, so tell us about this shooting. And from what, what I gathered that you had nothing to do with it, but there was somebody that just kind of threw your name in the mix. So tell us about this shooting in April of 1990. Well, as you just said, it was a shooting that took place by, um, to a guy named Michael Wilson that I don't know. And um, being respectful of the dead, if he walked in front of my face right now, is I know that's not possible, but uh, I wouldn't know who he was. Um, in 1990, you know, um, I was in between jobs and hanging around, you know, different neighborhoods. And I was hanging around a neighborhood with, you know, a few guys that I knew and, and, you know, the shooting took place. And because I was hanging around them at that time, at the, the time period, um, they came to me. In '93, um, they told me that they that they that they were told, you know, that I, I didn't have anything to do with it. But because of my connection to the guys, that they they felt done it was responsible. Um, they needed my help. And you know, yeah. this is the theme that I keep hearing over and over, Mister Burner, that you know, you know, you didn't do anything wrong. The police ask for your help and you say, okay, sure. You know, I'm, I'm going to help. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm, I'm not, I don't even know this person. I keep hearing this over and over. And then once you help them, they basically uh, decide to make you the, the criminal. And then wor- weren't they angry at you for not saying that somebody else was guilty because you, you didn't know about this other person. And then weren't they mad at you for not trying to, Indict well, somebody. Well, well, actually, they felt as though they was clear in in who they had, you know, paid for. Um, actually, it was the fact that I wouldn't help them. That um, you know, it, it, there was there was this 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 time, um, December ninety three. You know, they came to my grandmother's house. Um, <clears throat> they asked my mother to speak to me alone. You know, and they gave me this spiel about we knew we know you didn't have anything to do with it. You know, your partner's on board with us, and this is what he said, and you know, we need you to help him. So I told him I couldn't help him. So we went back and forth, you know, and um <clears throat> amongst that uh, uh, amidst that going back and forth, you know, one of the one of the uh agents slammed his hand on the table. It was like, Well, you don't help us, you going down with him. And, you know, once that happened, you know, my mom came downstairs and asked what was going on. So they asked, you know, for her to step outside so they could speak to her. And they essentially told her the same thing she told me. She's like, they told her, we know that your son didn't have nothing to do with it, but if he wants to be a tough guy, he gonna go down with his, with his buddies. Hmm. That's just, uh, that's just evil. That's just evil. So when you hear that, when you hear they're basically coming for you, uh, what are you thinking? What are you feeling as a young man? You're about to go to school. You have a job. You're taking care of yourself. What are you thinking when you're hearing like, oh, they're they're really out to get me? Well, I, at, the, at the particular time, I wasn't really thinking anything because I'm under the impression, you know, for me, knowing that I had no involvement, you know, I, I, I it wasn't an issue for me, you know, because... I wasn't there, I wasn't involved, and you can't get nobody to say that. So, you know, I, I didn't, I never seen it as an issue because I didn't think, you know, um, what wind up happening would happen. Yeah, and this actually happens in, uh, in uh, DC. And so they have a cooperating witness named Antoine Payton, and his story is constantly changing. It's just changing constantly. It's not making any sense as far as trying to say that you were a part of this of this crime. And there's the trial and there is paper thin evidence. I mean, I was reading about this case, paper thin evidence. It wasn't making any sense. This trial only lasts for a week. And normally a trial like this, at least today, would be much longer. So as you're in the trial, 
what are you thinking as you're hearing these these lies uh, against you and the witness that's just changing their story, you know, nonstop? Well, going going back to, <clears throat> I want to say it was Jan January uh, or, or or December uh, of '93, you know, when it was initially brought brought up. Um, you know, some time went on, and as I say, you know. I, I wasn't concerned about it because I knew I wasn't there and I had nothing to do with it. So, you know, it wasn't an issue for me, you know, so time went on. Um, and it got to the point where they was going to the grand jury, my co-defendants were going in front of the grand jury, which I wasn't a part of the grand jury. I'm what you call a grand jury original. So first of all, Antoine Payton told them that he wasn't there. And there was other things that he could not speak to that showed that he wasn't there. But going back into the grand jury, um, they went through, went through, okay, um, well, what happened, what happened, and yeah, with Troy wasn't out there, I would expected to see him, but he wasn't out there. Um, and then it was like maybe a minute and 35 seconds. I, I'm not sure if the grand jury convenes for 20 minutes or something of that nature, but it was a minute and 35 seconds before um, the grand jury is supposed to conclude. And after all, you know, all through the grand jury testimony, my name is Troy wasn't there, Troy wasn't there. Somebody um, conveniently asked um, at the minute 35 seconds, well, where was Troy Burnham? And then it's, oh, he was on the corner. And that's how I was indicted. Hmm. Wow. And so what was the trial like for you? I mean, you know, I guess, you know, me not necessarily having uh, any knowledge or experience um, in the courtroom and in the trial, um, I really, I really didn't have no expectations, though, you know, sitting there and start hearing, you know, the story that's, or the narrative that's being advanced, you know, and I'm just sitting and I'm like, you know, it's un unbelieving, you know, but, you know, um, for me, you know, once I was indicted, I was released three weeks later um, on personal recognizance, which is unheard of in a murder trial in any state or any city. <clears throat> um, so again, you know, I'm 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 figuring, you know, I'm 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 showing up to I'm, I'm showing up to court every day, and you know, and I'm here and I'm available, and I'm and I'm just assuming that. You know, um, the jury, as well as you know, the prosecutor and the judge as well, and you know, see, you know, it was plainly clear that, you know, I had no involvement. But I got found guilty after a four-day trial. I'm not even sure. A four-day trial. It's less than a week. I'm not even sure if you can answer this question. You're you're found guilty, uh, May of 1994. Um, first degree murder, 35 years to life. But I mean, the, the, the evidence is so thin, uh, you know, uh, testimony is changing. I mean, how, uh, again, I'm sure you were thinking the same thing, but what about reasonable doubt? How, how is this jury finding you guilty? When, when I read the details of your case, I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Why, why do you think you were found guilty? Well, I think, you know, there, there, there's this belief, you know, um, that you're guilty and prove, prove, until proven innocent. Um, and I just think that, you know, <clears throat> this was a particular time, you know, um, and quite frankly, you know, I think, you know, this is what our, our system is designed to do. Um, you know, we were coming off, uh, years of DC being a murder capital with 700, 800, 900 murders. 
Um, they have all these cold cases. In all, in all actuality, in 1990, if I'm not mistaken, we that was when we actually were the, mur the murder capital where I think we had somewhere uh, close to a thousand murders. And I think, you know, it was it was it was a combination of you know these co these cases these cases stacking up in a code, and they brought in these uh, task force officers and FBI from you know other states and things of that nature, and, and you know the objective was just um, to close these cases, and that's how that's how they they uh, investigated the cases, that's how they prosecuted the cases. And that's how the judges, you know, prosecute the case. So, it, it, you know, it, 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 it became clear to me at a point, you know, that it wasn't necessarily about, you know, whether or not I actually had something to do with it. It was the fact that, you know, this case needed to be closed. Somebody had to answer for it. And this goes to these numbers that, that, that they come to you know, to satisfy whatever, you know, incoming politician or whatever is going on, you know, somebody got to answer for, you know, somebody got to be held accountable for this. We, we're not going to be held accountable for the creation of this environment that we, we perpetuated. Somebody's got to pay and, you know, it came down to it. I paid. Right. Versus, versus trying to fix the problem in these communities. They just want to find somebody they could uh, pin it on and say, hey, now we fixed it because we're locking them up. I mean, but I think, you know, in, in fixing those problems, one of the things, you know, that's going to be difficult, you know, because you have action and you got fame action. You know, and, and the fame action is where you're, you're acting as though you're trying to fix the problem. But the reality is, if you go to the root of the problem, the, the problem is created by the system. And that doesn't mean that nobody has an accountability for the things they do and they involve themselves in. But the fact remains, they're put, we're put in these impoverished communities, we are put in the, under these circumstances because policies, legislations, um, uh, 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 and then just the things, you know, for me and my belief, you know, it's just, you know, this was a time in the crack era where as though um, this was a pre-designed plan to uh, further break down the black family structure. Well, yeah, and we yeah. do know that crack was infiltrated in our, in our communities. That's just a fact at this point. We do know that with Reagan and Contra and all the whole bit. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so you're 24 years old. You are again uh, convicted 35 years to life in 19. At that particular time, Sorry. I was I was 21 years old. The the the, the actual crime happened when I was seven. When I was 17, I went. Oh I, I, I I I didn't go to jail until I was 21. Wow, damn. So you're 21 years old. Uh, I mean, I, I ask this question all the time, but uh, going behind bars, going to prison, um, as a young man, how are you getting by day by day? How are you surviving? Well, you know, uh, you know, as I, as, as I told you, you know, there was a considerable amount of things that I was doing. Um, so I was at I was at a point in my life where you know um, I knew who I was you know I understood what direction you know I was trying to take my life. Um, so being found guilty, you know, I just you know I just told myself my whole thing was uh, I am who I am. Um, I'm not going to go into this situation where I'm trying to make no examples or prove this and prove that. Uh, long as long as you stayed out my way, I'm gonna stay out your way, you know. And I'm gonna try not to get into, you know, the everyday, um, you know, as they call it, rigmarole of, you know, of prison. And, and that's definitely hard to do. And, and you know, and quite frankly, you know, I found my, myself in the midst of a lot of it. 
you know, but, you know, fortunately for me, you know, again, um, once I went inside, you know, I was comfortable, you know, in my own skin. Um, I wasn't going to allow, allow, allow myself to be disrespected and I'm not going to disrespect nobody. And, you know, I'm going to just take my shot in this, you know, surviving thing, you know, because, you know, with, for me, you know, I always, I always figured somehow it's funny that my, my biggest fear, you know, became a reality, you know, of, of being in that situation for something, you know, that I didn't do. And I always felt that however, you know, I allowed myself, I mean, things gonna happen, you know, a lot of things in prison just happen outside your control, you know, and just things happen where, you know, you just have to, you know, deal with it accordingly. You know, fortunately for me, you know, situations, you know, arose or didn't arose where, you know, I was able to, you know, to, to continue on, be who I was and, and keep from finding myself in a situation of, of, of getting more time, which, which I think I thought more about my family than I did with myself because it would be like they would be losing me twice. So, you know, uh, I just, you know, <laughs> you know, I took the deep side, you know, when I was found guilty, you know, and then when I was, when I was given my sentence, you know, he asked, it, was there anything to say? I actually, he gave me my sentence and, and at a particular time spoke on, you know, not necessarily believing that, you know, this was, you know, what it was supposed to have been, but yet he still uh, ran my sentence wow. And gave me the 35 to life, man. You know, I just I just exhaled, exhaled and um, you know, and moved. Wait, hold up, Mr. Burner. I'm sorry. The the judge, when he was sentencing you, he was doubting the uh the conviction when he was sentencing I, you. I don't I don't necessarily know if it was that he was doubting the conviction or he was doubting the fact that uh he should be giving me the time that he was giving me, you know, because he went wow. to speak, he went to speak on the fact that. Um, at this particular time, which is not the same now, but at this particular time, um, murder, for first degree murder, um, was a mandatory 20 to life. Then I had the assault with intent to kill was, was, was a, a, a mandatory, um, was a five to 15 mandatory five. And then it was a, uh, possession, possession of found during a crime of violence. Which was never, which was another mandatory sentence, and he ran everything well. Where, which they actually um, commuted, you know, once I got to Lawton, but you know, that's that's what he gave me on paper. Wow. And how was your family affected by this when you went uh, behind bars? How were they affected? It's a story, you know, that I tell, and <laughs> and uh. And, and, and it's not funny, but, you know, my mom don't like when I tell this story, but even to this day, I can hear my mom screaming in the courtroom. Um, and it was like, no matter how much noise was in there, I didn't hear no other noise but her. You know, um, at the particular time, uh, you know, I had a younger brother, um, and he was like maybe 14, 15, about to just go to high school. And um, somehow, you know, um, I was kind of like a God to him, you know? Um, so he definitely, you know, took it hard, maybe the hardest. Um, fortunately, you know, for us all, uh, he persevered, you know, went into the military and, and uh, took care, you know, everybody and everything that he could um, because I couldn't no more. Um, my, grand, my, my grandmother, you know, one of the, you know, it's, it's funny, it, this is another story, but, you know, one day my grandmother, you know, was a, community, a community provider and activist and things of that nature. And 
you know, um, one day, you know, when I was hanging with Antoine, you know, and I bought her in the house, I bought him in the house. So, you know, she was like, get him out of here. So, you know, how we done, I'm, I'm sure, you know, this, this universal, you know, oh, grandma, you know, and, and you know, and, and really, I didn't really see it because again, like my grandmother helped raise a lot of people, kids, you know, she had uh, kid programs and uh, young adult programs, you know, to help them to go to school and things of that nature, you know, when she was like, man, get them out of here. And, you know, I don't want them in here no more. So I'm like, grandma, that's my friend, you know? And she was like, um, that's not your goddamn friend, you know, excuse my language. And, um, and I don't want them in here no more, you know? So, uh, the day, that the verdict came back, you know, I, I I had some shoes or something, you know, this, that was over a house, you know, that I wanted to wear and just, you know, and I went past the seer, you know, and and I and, and I uh, I apologized to her, you know, and I said, man, you know, I said I want to apologize to you because I said, man, you told me something a little while ago, and I said and I didn't listen, and I said. It seems I'm about to pay for. So she was like, what you mean? So I told her, she was like, what's going on? So I was telling her, I said, though, and that's where I go back to, like I'm telling you, I, I just know there's no possibility that I'm gonna get found guilty. Yet, the morning that I was found guilty, I told my grandmother, I said, something don't feel right. You know what I mean? And I said, man, you know, I apologize. I said, I didn't listen to her. And I said, and it seems as though I'm about to pay for it. You know, so, you know, there's so many stories, you know, of family, uh, how it affected my family in so many ways, because I think, you know, um, most of my family, you know, if not all were attested to this, you know, um, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't doing bad, you know, before I went and there wasn't no drug money, but it wasn't necessarily about money. I was a provider. I was a glue. Um, and me and my grandma were like two peas in the pods, you know, a lot of time there's that joke that I was her youngest son, you know, whatever. So, you know, my family was uh, severely, you know, affected. Um, you know, I lost my grandmother. Uh, in 2002, you know, that's, you know, and I, and I still to this day have yet to actually be able to mourn that. So my family, you know, um, severely affected, you know, but with, I think it's proven, you know, through time and history, you know, whatever, you know, black families go through, they, they gonna find a way to survive. And, you know, they continued on and support me. And, you know, um, outside of God, that was my biggest strength in allowing to allow me to be here today. Thank you for sharing that. I think we all have uh, memories of our grandmother that just uh, stay with us. And I'm, I'm sorry that she, uh, she, uh, she transitioned. I'm really sorry to hear that, especially as you were behind bars. Huh. So, uh, 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 Antoine Payton, he, he recanted his, uh, false testimony. Uh, the two other people who actually committed the murder, they admitted their guilt. Uh, they confirmed that you were not involved. Uh, tell me how you eventually got your freedom, uh, 24 years later in November of 2018. Well, you know, that's 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 kind of interesting story, you know. Um, but I guess in short, um, somebody came to the federal institution that I was in. It was somebody from Alabama, Mississippi, or somewhere of that nation, and um. Maybe a year or two it went by before I even, you know, got wind of, of it. But, you know, you know, a dude 
another dude actually that I just that I didn't know but knew of me. He was like, "Man, I think I got something to belong to you." And he met a, he made a time for us to meet with each other, and um, he brought me some papers out. And the paper and the, and the paper and the paper that he brought out was a signed affidavit from Antoine Payton saying he yes. recanted. And when, when when did he recant? Uh, maybe two thousand ten or something of that, some somewhere around there. Wow. Wow. And so that happens around two thousand ten, but it takes eight years for you to get for you to get released. Do you know? Do you know why, or is that just how incompetent the system is? Well, you know. <laughs> uh, First of all, um, I uh, I like to uh, shout out, you know, the Mid Atlanta Innocent Project. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something, you know, that I experienced with them. That actually, my case has changed how they review cases and decide to take cases because this was my third time reaching out to them. And the two times prior, they refused to, to take my case. And, you know, obviously, you know, you can get your interpretation of what you read and, 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 and kind of discern, you know, what happened or whatever, but you know, I think, you know, for me, <clears throat> being in that situation and, you know, from day one, you know, um, filing all my appeals and, you know, my, um, my other, uh, my other remedies and, you know, 23-110s and things of that nature. Um, and, you know, just writing around, writing around the different people, just like throwing your hand up, like, you know, help. You know, and it just got to a point, you know, um, one of my co defendants had just, you know, he, 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 he sent, um, he sent me, he sent me a message through somebody else and he was like, man, look, man, you know, it shouldn't have had to take this long, man, but it's time, um, I'm here for you to do the right thing, you know? And so, you know, I filed um, my Innocent Protection Act motion. And, and once I filed it, um, then, you know, um, I told my mother to, you know, reach out to certain people. Uh, as, I, as I wrote people, she called um, Seth, Seth Rosenthal, which is, which is, uh, He's the uh, chairman of the board of the Mid Atlantic Instant Project. And um, I filed a motion, and the judge uh, granted, you know, which is kind of like a post, post, post conviction discovery. And um, here I go. And what's interesting <laughs> is that you were released on parole in uh, 2018. And you continue to fight and fight uh, for your exoneration. And in uh, August of 2020, the prosecution finally decided to d dismiss charges after you fighting and fighting for your uh, for your exoneration. Is that accurate? Well, well, well let me let me uh, make a clarification. Mm -hmm. I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't released on parole. Mm. I was I was released under the newly instituted. Uh, Incarceration Reduction Amendment Act of, 2000, mm. of 2016 mm. that was spearheaded by the Campaign to Fair Sentence of Youth and, and, and legislated by, you know, D.C. Council, Charles Allen, Kane McDuffie, and, you know, uh, the other members of the council. That's what I was releasing. I was released on. I was, it, it, it's not necessarily parole because I was on 
supervised release, which is like another form of a pro probation. I was right. sent for time served and released on, on, on probation. I want to ask you this. Uh, so again, the charges are dropped in, uh, in, in August of 2020, but so the, the, the federal prosecutors, they dismissed the charges against you yet. This person, Sheila, Mil she Sheila Miller, a spokeswoman for the U S attorney's office said this, according to the Washington post quote, Mr. Burner has not shown that he was actually innocent unquote. I was really disgusted when I when when I read that. What what's you, your reaction to that? You you, you do. <laughs> yeah, like that's not how this works. Well, Ms. you Ms. know, and, 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 and let me and let and, and let me and let me and let me take that back. I wasn't disgusted, you know, because okay. um, I come to understand that that's how they do, you know, mm. and and that's and that's the thing, you know, with life and the system. You know, there, there's there's this accountability, you know, that they expect on the other side, but they don't do it this their own. You know, they they don't you know they don't want to be responsible, and, and you know, and it's like things that happen where you're just not going to admit that you was wrong. You know, and you 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 you. I was taking a trial. And it's not only, and it's not only for me, you know. And obviously, you know, we hear about me, you know. But you're taking a trial with at 21 years old, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the other guy. He was already a career felon, convicted murderer, and had loads of 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 dead time and other places where he was let out. And he told you, you know that he wasn't dead because he told you he wasn't dead. But then even, even then with his evidence and you try to attach it to everything else, things don't coincide. But you convicted four people by one witness that you know is lying. So in all actuality, I can't remember this lady name. She she could say what she want, but the reality is it gets to a point where there's even a time in his testimony with something about me where they advanced a theory that they knew to be true, but that they knew to be untrue, but yet they still advance this theory. And ethically, as a prosecutor, that's a violation. Mm -hmm. But these are not the things that they're going to speak on because, again, they want to be, this is one of the situations that just fell on a crack and it wasn't because of our wrongdoing, but yet I've been made to be accountable and, and, and pay a price that that's just what it is. Okay, yeah, he hasn't proved this, he hasn't proved that. Well, why didn't you choose to prosecute him? Mm -hmm. Because the reality is even, even at the particular time, again, I got out on the pre-detention hearing because the judge found that it was more likely than that that I wasn't involved. They changed judges. I was returned to the street for, for 12 months prior to trial. But these are the things that they're not going to stand on and question or look at these things as the support of why your conviction was faulty. They just want to make it seem like, you know, it, it, it happens, but it do happen, right. but it happens with the intentional design on your side of misconduct on some way. 